Um, let me make an announcement before we go to our next witness. The line for oral testimony obviously is closed, and all who wish to provide oral testimony have now registered. We are now going to reopen for cards either for or against and written. Um, we are going to allow those who wish to register a position or those who wish to submit written testimony to do so until 9 p.m. this evening. And at 9 p.m. we're going to uh, try to draw lines so that we can start entering all these people into our records. So 9 p.m. They've got nine hours to come and sign up. Um, yes, Senator Zeffrini. One simple question. You said that we were not going to vote on the Senate bill, but would wait for the House bill to come on. That is correct. But at that time, are you going to hear testimony again, or is no. this, this is the testimony for the, testimony. the House bill? Correct. correct. Thank you. Um, Dr. Love? Go Good ahead. Good morning. <clears throat> My name is Dr. Michael Love. I'm here to support Senate Bill 1. I'm representing myself, not any hospital or any other organization. I'm a board certified OBGYN who practices here in Austin. In addition to that, I am the chairman of the CME committee, which oversees physician education for seven area hospitals. I'm also a member of the American College of Medical Quality, a new and upcoming uh, college to support the quality in medicine. I want to speak to several issues. Number one is requiring hospital privileges for physicians who perform abortions. This is considered the standard of care. It maintains a patient-physician relationship. It does not erode the patient-physician relationship. It actually strengthens it. Um, if we look at ACOG Practice Bulletin number 67, it says that surgical curatage must be available on a 24-hour basis for cases of hemorrhage. Clinicians who wish to provide medical abortion services either should be trained in surgical abortion or should work in the conjunction with a clinician who is trained in that surgical abortion. The FDA also mirrors the same recommendation. In regards to the FDA regulations, um, FDA, which approved it first in 2000, has subsequently reapproved um, their protocol most recently in June of 2011. A very interesting study that has been glossed over by um, in the States is a study out of Finland in the obstetrics and gynecology, also known as the Green Journal, which addresses the complications found in medical abortion versus surgical abortion. What's unique about this article is not a research-based protocol, but a community-based research. It shows the actual complications of medical abortions to be at 20% versus 5.6% for surgical abortions. I've included that in the packet, and we'll be happy to discuss that with you. Whenever a drug is administered that has the potential serious side effects, the physician should be there and readily available. And finally, I support raising the standards of, abor of abortion facilities. There's always the potential for complications when using medications such as this. That's the reason why we administer methotrexate for ectopic pregnancies in the controlled settings as well, because of the risk of complications. I think it's important to remember that this is not an issue of restricting services, but improving safety for the patient and meeting the standard of care to protect women. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Duell. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, Dr. Love, what, uh, you've heard the arguments against requiring an abortion center to be an ambulatory surgical clinic. Would you perhaps just briefly outline why you think that they should be? Well, actually, more importantly, um, you know, I spoke to a person who has specialized in safety and medical quality um, in this area for over 20 years. And when I spoke to this person, I said, you know, give me your opinion of what is it safest to have these procedures performed. And she deals with inspections on a yearly basis, both of ambulatory surgery centers and hospitals. And she said, by far and away, an ambulatory surgery center is safer. It has a higher level of responsibility. And in addition, these are inspected not only by the Department of Health Services, but they're inspected by JCO and several other um, organizations that provide this. Um, basically, the reason that entails is because they take Medicaid and Medicare dollars. So, you know, it's kind of a, we're looking at this from one viewpoint of only the state health department inspecting it. But when you have national organizations that also inspect these facilities, they have a pretty much a higher level of uh, care that they have to respond to. Would you acknowledge that there probably are some things 
that are, that are required of an ambulatory surgical center that don't directly relate relate to abortion. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, but that's also true of hospitals and medical offices and what you and I do in our medical offices, that we just have certain requirements that raises the overall level of care, which may not be particularly needed in a, in a given situation. So that's not really that unusual. Um, that would be correct. And, and what uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, the RU486. Tell me, uh, compare the FDA, the most current FDA protocol with guidelines from ACOG, why do you think we we should follow the uh, protocol that we're, we're proposing in this bill? Well, the most recent update in 2011 um, basically pointed out the 5 to 8 percent incomplete abortion rate um, with medical abortions. And this pretty much mirrors what was found in the Finland study. What is unique about the Finland study is that it is a pretty much a homogenous country that has socialized medicine, and all abortions have to go through an abortion registry. So everything can be tracked very well. And as opposed to American studies that have significant limitations, and we can discuss those studies as well because I have those if you would like a copy. But in the Finnish study, they were able to follow these, and their one caveat is that they were not able to follow the minor complications in the private practice setting. So there's the potential for complications to be even higher. But what they found was a 20% complication rate. So, I mean, when you look at incomplete abortion rate in the Finland study, it, additionally, it basically mirrors what the FDA has stated. Have you ever had to take care of a woman who had a complication from an abortion? Yes. Okay, and the doctor that performed the abortion was not available? That's correct. Okay. And would you say that uh, the complication rate is underreported in the state of Texas for abortions? Based on this community-based study, as opposed to some of the other studies that ACOG has used that were based on um, research protocols, yes, I would say that is true. Um, and not all women will report their complications um, <coughs> for personal reasons. Um, so, yep. Do you, uh, do you think of the standard of care for a physician uh, in the state of Texas is to provide for after hours care and care complications? If you're going to participate in a surgical procedure or a medical procedure that could require surgical um, services, yes, I think it's very important. Yeah. And this bill does that? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Dr. Lowe, you were here earlier when we discussed the requirements for licensed abortion facilities versus ambulatory surgical centers. I was. Can you give me two or three requirements that are that ambulatory surgical centers are subject to that would benefit the licensed abortion facilities in terms of increasing the safety for their patients? I am respected to decline on that because I'm not a specialist in inspecting ambulatory surgery centers, and I don't know the rules as well as other people do who actually own and run the centers. But generally, do you know what the difference in the requirements are? Um, I think the basic requirement is that they have an operating room that is set aside solely for that procedure as opposed to using any room. And if you look at the basic definition of an ambulatory surgery center. It has an increased surgery room size, is the, the, the requirement that's stated here. Increased hallway width, male locker rooms, janitor closets, patient burn log, visitors injury logs. How would those requirements increase the health the safety of patients at licensed abortion facilities? Well, I don't feel like I'm the expert to answer that question. Unfortunately, the expert that would probably be best to do that is involved in a, sur a survey this week. So it would be nice to have you meet with her and discuss this to help you understand why she feels it's much safer. Like I say, she's been involved in the area of patient safety for over 20 years. So if you would like to speak to this uh, person, we can see if we can arrange that. That would be nice. I would appreciate that. Okay. Thank you. You heard earlier that licensed abortion facilities are inspected annually. Yes. The ambulatory surgical centers are, uh, are inspected every three to six years. And that's by uh, the Department of State Health Services. That's not um, also counting the other agencies that inspect ambulatory surgery centers because they take Medicare and Medicaid dollars. So JCO will inspect those as well. So that adds another layer of complexity to um, the ambulatory surgery center. Well, if this bill passes, do you believe that licensed abortion facilities should be inspected every three to six years instead of every year? 
No, you I think, don't. Would that be satisfactory? No, I don't think it is. I mean, you have to look at the overall picture. You're only taking part of the picture and trying to generalize that. I'm taking the whole picture that these ambulatory surgery centers also have other inspections that abortion facilities do not have. So you need to make sure that you look at the complete picture about how they're inspected and the rules and regulations that they follow. And again, um, the expert that I could refer you to is occupied this week, but we could probably have you meet with her and discuss this. That would be good. So you're saying that because JACO and other organizations inspect ambulatory surgical centers, their three to six year inspection is satisfactory? Um, you know, I would leave that to the expert, but I would also ask the uh, expert witness that we had earlier how often she inspects the um, hospitals. But we know from what's been shown in surveys that, you know, hospitals rise to the occasion, have a great safety record, such as St. David's, which has been shown to be, or through surveys, the safest hospital in the United States currently. You also talked about fetal pain. Do you have any scientific evidence, substantial scientific evidence, that an unborn child feels pain at 20 weeks? Actually, I did not uh, address fetal pain because um, I'm not an expert in the field of pain. I can tell you that the fetus does respond to stimuli. When I'm performing ultrasounds, um, the fetus does move uh, when you apply stimuli to move the baby so that you can see different parts of the anatomy. But do you have any substantial medical evidence that an unborn child feels pain at no, 20 weeks? I do not. I'm not an expert in pain itself. You've not read any such literature? No, I have not. Do you know of any such literature that we could read? Um, no, but I could probably find an expert who could address that for you. I would appreciate that. Okay. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Schwartner. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Dr. Lowe, you, this issue in reference to ambulatory surgical centers and versus the licensed abortion facilities, um, on my reading of the pertinent health and safety code, section 243, there are five minimum standards. One is the construction and design. But the second one is the qualifications of the professional staff and personnel. The third one is the equipment essential to the health and safety of the patients. The fourth one is the sanitary conditions within the center and its surroundings. And the fifth one is the quality assurance program. Is this not something that is applicable to the health and safety, these criteria, in reference to women wanting to avail themselves of, a, of an abortion? Are these standards not something that we should meet as a state, as 24 other states across this country have met? Well, my personal belief is that safety should always triumph over convenience, and the health and safety of the individual should be preeminent as a physician when we're practicing medicine. And if you can improve the safety of the individual, then you should do so. I hope that answers your question. I'm not sure if I answered it. No, you, in addition to these increased minimum standards of ASC versus the licensed abortion facility, you, you touched on something I think is very important, that ASC standards and ASCs are regulated by JCO, whereas licensed abortion facilities are not. That is your understanding as well? Yes. 